Hey there. Good morning. How are you? I'm all right. Are you sick? Oh yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Did it get worse. Did it worse last night. You didn't seem uh, sick last night. A, l- a little bit, but it's just a head cold. It's like not not the end of the world. It's annoying. And how did the kids like the play? They had a good time. It was late for them. They were tired, and it's been. I was tired. Yeah, it's been like an exhausting week. I told you, Olivia's anxiety stuff, and Jack's been having. It's just, yeah, it's been a long week. I have an idea for you on her. Remind me to tell you about it. It's what cured Tori um, of her very not not crippling, but close. Like she went through a period of really bad. really bad anxiety and kind of depression that would come on from out of nowhere for no good reason. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll tell you, there's a yeah. lot of clinical evidence for it. Um, okay. Put her head next to a, a, a horse's leg and kick it. Is that <laughs> fall down a well kicked yeah. by a mule? Whatever. Um, it was, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You're, How are you, Betty? You're cutting in and out just so you know, Christine, a little bit. I don't know if you're on your normal Wi-Fi. Or- Am I? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on my mobile right now. Yeah, it's okay. It like, I- as you would expect with a mobile hotspot, like right now it's fine, but then sometimes it'll go a little jittery and then come yeah. back. So I would say just in general, to plan on not doing long monologues or talks, but I think you'll be okay and people get the gist of it. All right, so I'm going to, Actually, you're a you're the host of this, right? Because they it made me sign in as a host too. Can I get in and out without any problem? Yeah, but without it'll, it'll bringing the whole. It'll thing probably out? give you the option to end the meeting for everybody. So just be super careful when you leave to not click. Right. I'm gonna. I'll get out right now. I'll come back in on normal Wi-Fi to open it. Then if I have to leave, which I may or may not, Doug's going to decide when he wants to go. But if I have to leave. I'll exit out, switch over to my mobile, because yeah. then all I'm doing is rapping and one of you guys can rap. Yeah. Right. And then the other thing you could I'm do is call, the- call in from your phone, right? So that your audio is through, like you can connect the two, you know, it says like dial for bit Wi-Fi or whatever, and then you'll have at least the consistent audio going in theory. Self-service. Okay. Let me do that. All right. So I'm going to get can- out of here. But you could just, you don't even have to get out. I don't think you can just go, let's see here. Uh, Where the, oh, all right. She's such a good listener. <laughs> so, good listener. so I was able to re-register and then now I have it all. I don't know why it didn't yeah, populate. It's been such a nightmare. I was like super worried because I've like, I, all I did is I created a webinar. Great. And at some point I switched it to a meeting, which wasn't supposed to change anything. All the registrations stayed the same, but allows us to have the video. And then, you know, I've had to like delete one occurrence. I've had to change the date of another occurrence. But then I had multiple people being like, it's not on my calendar. I didn't receive anything. Gotcha. Like, it's like, a, and it's, a, and then it, what's annoying for me, Christine and Uday, we're all set as hosts. And as a host, you can't register for the event, which means then we never get it. We never got a calendar invite for it to begin with. So then like, I, it's just, it's. And if it was me doing it, I would soon it assume it's all user error but it's you doing no, it no no it's me it's- i'm like yeah i'm glad some people flagged it like even larry sent i had to send like three different emails to get him on it which i'm glad he's engaged enough to be like i still right. didn't get it i still didn't get it which is awesome but uh yeah i was like very very nervous but it didn't, it didn't go on my calendar at all it was nowhere to be found yeah it won't so the problem is the way they send it it doesn't pop up one of those ones that automatically goes on kind of grade until you accept it oh you that's click, a you have problem. to go into the email and then you have to click like add to count why is that it's not it's not an invite because it's an email coming from zoom right it's not like the calendar invite that i'm sending um I don't maybe know. that's what we should change i mean maybe this should all start being but then how do you well, no, we talked about doing that. I can do, I can do it. That just the reg- well, then we need to create a, some sort of registration portal that then I have to make. It's annoying, but fine. Right. Manually track and then like you know, as they come in, I just need to make sure. That I makes add- sense to me now, though, because it's like um, my Deloitte women's thing and um, like Hatesh's deal last night. Those things don't end up on my calendar, yeah. and that's exactly why, because I'm not going in and doing something in the email that I'm supposed to do. I always like cross check whenever I get an email, I just see, is it on my calendar? Cause Google does some cool, like nice things. Like if you book like an airline flight and it comes in through email, a lot of times it'll automatically add it. 
But yep. sometimes it won't. Um, okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, you know, the magic. Christine, did you dial in through audio or do you just switch? No, so I'm just... Know, just before you, if you go down to the mute button, the little up arrow, the little carrot, if you click on that sort of, I think one, two, three up from the bottom, third up from the bottom says switch to phone audio. Okay. That way you don't have to like leave the meeting. It'll just give you a dial in number and blah, blah, blah. All right. Let me do that. And then I'll, um, yeah. Uh, oh, but so then. But how do I do it from my phone? It's giving me a chance to dial in from here, but I don't want to dial in from there. Yeah, no, no, no. That's what you want. Dial in. Oh, I have to make, oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> I, what? There's nothing to just put, <laughs> magically push. I have to dial. I, I don't know why Zoom, I think Zoom offers that in the in like a more expensive package where it like calls you and then you can like just answer it and then it connects the two. But... So am I going to end up then with this? <laughs> Um, you know, like half the time I go to um, uh, do something like this and you get the echo. No, so is that because why... it's going to kill your computer audio and just connect to your phone. All right. So like when you go to move and get in the car, if you're still on this thing, just kill your video for a little bit yeah. while you're moving around. Um, and then your audio should stay connected the whole time um the video might cut in and out please re-enter your meeting id oh, followed sorry, by hold on no. i'm not paying attention eight I nine know. i can tell or uh, you have not entered any numbers please re-enter your meeting id followed by pound goodbye i'm entering i'm entering as fast as i can too slow no, like it wasn't realizing I was entering, I think. Three, six, um, two, oh, nine. I haven't even thought about how I'm going to intro this thing. Uh, you know what I should do for this one is actually turn on a, I think it's too late, but turn on a um, waiting room so that people can join them and I can admit them so that like we can all, because people are going to start. Joining. That's fine. I, mean, I I don't mind. It's all family. We'll banter with them. Thank you, Betty, for putting together that document. I like glanced at it when we were at this play last night, but I have not had a chance. But I will after this sit down and power through it, man. I spent yeah. five hours doing it. I was like, I'm going to get it all out of my brain right now. Get it done. Get um, it done. That artifact website confirmed it was fifteen grand to build that that landing page, which is, I don't know, not bad for a pretty nice thing. That's expensive for one is landing it? page. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I don't, I don't have context. But give me the contact anyway. Yeah, Just yeah. send it to me. Because yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send it out reg regardless when we're ready. Three, four, eight, zero. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Hi. How are you, Bev? Hey, Joyce. We're Good trying morning. to sing. Good morning. Hello. Good, Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I was all, I was trying to find the buttons. <laughs> I have so many screens on my. Oh, so many windows so many on my windows screen. On my screen. It took me a while. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. I'm killing that, Casey. There's, I, I'm getting too much feedback here. It's not going to work. So I'll figure it out when we, okay, if and when we need to. Sounds good. Kathy Lego. Good morning. How are From you? Texas. Are you in Texas? Yes, I am. All is well here. Great. Glad to hear it. How are you, Joyce? I'm doing great. Thank you. How about yourself, Christine? Excellent. Excellent. Hayden, where are you coming in from? I am coming in from Iceland. 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 
I think you're going to get the prize on this one for longest call. Thank you. Good you morning, Bev. Oh, we have Bev mm. K here. I feel very honored. The Bev K, multiple award-winning author and expert in all things culture and how to engage a workforce. I, I'm reading through all your books, <laughs> Bev. They're excellent. Uh, you guys make sure Susan isn't having a problem. How do you got that? I got it. And um, who's going to run the deck, Betty? Are you running the deck or is Susan? Hi. Rusty. Oh, well, I was wrong, Heaton. We've got, Hello, Christine. what time is it in South Africa? It's seven in the evening. Wow. Okay. Oh. That's, that's not a bad time. It's yeah. cocktail time. Perfect. <laughs> it's definitely an honor to have you here, Rusty. How amazing Thanks, is that? Christine. Hey, Maria. Hello, everyone. Hi, Maria. All right. Well, we're letting people assemble. And I just reached out to Susan to make sure she's not having a difficult time. Um, would you resend her the link, please? Yes. Actually, Casey, can you make sure you send that to her since I'm not sure I even have the right one after all my issues this morning? And then Betty, maybe you can tee the deck up so she doesn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Grab it. Oh, we have Roz coming in. Good morning. Hi, Dijon. Hi, Roz. Good morning. How are you? Doing well, thank you. How are you? Um, I am great. It is so nice to have you here, Roz. Thank you for inviting her. Oh, you're welcome. And Michelle's joining. We'll give people, well, we usually start this about three minutes after if anybody wants to grab their tea or whatever. Hi, Bev. <laughs> Hi, Dina. Good morning. Hi, oh, good gosh, morning. This is this is the day of the amazing authors. We have Larry Sen coming in. Bev and Larry, do you guys know each other? You're, I mean, you're both culture gurus. You both have all these amazing books on culture and employee engagement. Larry Sen of Sen Delaney. Yes. Larry, meet Bev K. I think we met. 30 or 40 years ago, oh something my like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, Christine, do you have Susan's phone number? Just because yeah, she, I, I just saw her. She's here. She's here. Oh, hey, Susan. Hi. Oh I'm my. here. We're letting people get assembled, Susan. While we wait for people to come in, Travis, great to see you. Thanks for joining. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to do is build, build out our HR community of CHROs and other top like talent and HR leaders, uh, and we'll be doing board training for them. There's an increase in interest to get CHROs on boards right now and into comp committees. So we're going to do some board training for them. If you guys know people who are fabulous CHROs that you think would make good candidates for that. We don't charge them for the board training and it's an excellent curriculum. And then we're probably also going to build out a chief revenue officer, head of sales um, organization community in the same way. And if they're interested in the board training, we'll provide it to them also. We've got a 
a CMO community that's awesome. We've got an engineering community that's awesome. We've got a CFO community, but we don't have representation from those two sets of voices. voices. So we'll take so, any recommendations you have when when people give us a warm intro, then you know we don't do the same level of um, filtering that we might if, if we're just looking at somebody online. All right, I see lots of faces coming in. Bernie from the East Coast, always great to see you. Hi, Jenny. LT, thanks for joining. Harish, John, Sarika, Cecile, Lisa Adams. How is the AI world, girl? Awesome. <laughs> Anybody is looking I'm for fired. some amazing marketing talent to help with AI strategy. Lisa's a multi-time CMO and she's spending all of her time right now helping other marketing teams and CMOs learn about how AI can impact the marketing organization in a positive way and how to use it. And she's been doing some amazing work. Good morning, Bella. Good morning, Good morning, Matthew. Good morning, Brittany. Hello. Good uh, morning. Um, let's see if either Susan or Betty wants to tee up the slide show. I will do introductions and then we can tune, turn Susan loose. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you all for joining on a Friday morning. It's heartwarming to see you. And I actually know and love so many of you that it's just a fabulous way to end, end the week and start the day. What this series is, is the Zappa Enrichment Series. Our mission as a company is to help everyone everywhere get filthy and rich to become the best version of themselves personally and professionally. So once a month, we find some amazing person and many of you, there's there's people on this call who we want to be speakers. You've got books, you've got expertise in a topic um, and you come in and you share that for an hour with whoever is on the call. And I'm bringing that up because for all of you with teams or networks or just friends who you think would value this kind of information, please forward the invitation to them. This is not a restricted community for the enrichment series. Anybody can get in and listen. So something like trust, you can send it to your whole team because one of the things that I've learned from Susan, who I'll introduce next, is I, for, for sure, I'll just speak for myself, I operated on a pretty fundamental set of misunderstandings about how trust is built. And when I started working with ChangeCast many, many years ago and started learning about the elements of trust, it made me think about how to build trust, not just in individual relationships, but within the team in a very different way. I realized that what I was thinking might have been an integrity issue was actually a precursor. It was. It didn't have anything to do with trust. It was really more about a precursor of roles and responsibilities or vulnerability. Or what I was thinking was an integrity issue was actually a, a competence issue or vice versa. So once I started to understand the elements and how they fit together, I started to lean in a very different way. And so that's what these kinds of sessions are about, is helping you be the best leader you can be, the best human you can be. We can go forward, whoever's running the slides. Um, our sponsors for this series include Zappa, which is my new company, um, all about human enrichment. Uh, we have the Empowered CMO group here. We've got the Eng community here. We've got Nextwork. Um, and then ChangeCast is our guest and um, has helped us build uh, Zappa and this series from the very beginning. And let me tell you about our guest today, which is Susan Wayne. Susan and I met a decade ago. Um, she is one of the founders of ChangeCast. If you need great change management, that is the first place I would take you to. But I've been fortunate to work with Susan in several different capacities. She's a former C-suite executive herself, 
but now she's also a personal and professional coach. She works with CEOs and C-suites to help each of us be our best, best version. And when I was leading Scalar and COVID hit, Susan wanted to do something to help the world get through COVID. And she decided to use her talents, which is around coaching. And she reached out to her network and said, hey, if you're a CEO or C-suite or some executive and you need help getting your team through this, I will give you free time, free coaching time to get you through this. And she partnered with me and we got Scalar through a pretty rough patch. And if it wasn't for Susan, it wouldn't have gone nearly as well as it did. And I credit Susan. Um, I learned a lot through that process about communication and building trust, even in difficult times. But she was really my mentor and partner through that. And she does that same thing for a lot of other people. So she's here today. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. Um, trust is something they build their foundation on as a company. They teach it. Um, and uh, Patty is actually writing a book on it. And so today we all get to benefit from their knowledge. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Susan. Great. It's so good to be with you all today and, um, you know, have a chance to share some thoughts with you, hopefully some inspiration on, um, on how you can build greater trust. And I want to start with the question that we've heard, Patty's the name of my business partner, Patty and I have heard, and I've heard a lot over the many years, which is we just need to trust each other, or you just need to trust me. And it's something that I imagine many of you have said or heard over the years. I certainly said it uh, many times before I started to understand it better. And I would say if I could stack rank the topics that are brought up with me, in my work with leadership teams and executive coaching, trust is for sure in the top three. And it's something that we all know deeply is important and we know it matters, but the fact is that it's not as simple as just trusting. So today, the name of my talk is to is deconstructing trust to build trust. So as Christine said, my hope is to unpeel the layers around trust, which is a complex topic, and to give you an insight or two that is valuable to you or fresh to you in some way, and hopefully to give you, and this is my invitation as we dive into this, to use this time to actually come out of here with one or two concrete things you're going to do to build greater trust in a relationship that you have. So. My hope is that you'll do it. So take out a pen and you know, jot on the side of your desk um, the, a couple of notes that will help you build trust. So let's go to the origins of trust, which is back to our tribal ancestral route, roots. And during those times when we were tribes people in a hunter-gatherer kind of um, a society, we had to trust each other and our ability to trust each other was central to our survival as a human species. So we had to quickly ascertain whether we could trust one another and we had to trust the hunters to be able to hunt game really effectively. We had to trust the warriors to protect our perimeters from external threats and the foragers to know which plants were safe for the tribe to eat. In other words, we had to rely on each other to play our parts. We had to know what each other's parts were, and we had to be good at playing our parts. And every one of us, no matter how capable we were, was vulnerable. We were vulnerable to others to play their parts well in order for the tribe to survive. So clear roles and expectations, knowing what each other were gonna do for the tribe and the fact that we were interdependent and vulnerable were table stakes in our ability to survive as a species. And even though today's operating context in our lives and societal context couldn't be more different, these two same factors are still true today. So we're still all vulnerable, we're humans, we need each other. No matter how competent any one of us is in our space, we need others 
to be able to succeed. And a key dependency that we have is on clear roles, goals, and expectations. So you're going to hear me say this a number of times today. You'll probably get sick of me saying this. And this is, I think, one of what Christine was alluding to when she said the precursors, because a precursor to build, um, build uh, trust is clear roles, goals, and expectations. I'm sorry, you guys, my, my parent, I met my mom and dad's and their phone's ringing and I don't know how to turn it off. So sorry about that. It'll and happen. they still have a phone. I mean, like, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, they're in a different generation. I'll right. say it that way. Right. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's funny. It is. That's a whole nother topic. Yes. It's an interesting generational thing. Okay. I'm going to keep going here. It stopped. So when we think about trust, we, over the, you know, millennia, we have built very sharp instincts about our ability to trust, uh, assess whether we can trust each other or not. And Malcolm Gladwell actually says we, in a matter of a few seconds, we decide if we're going to trust each other or not. And so we have these sharp honed instincts about whether we're going to trust. And one of my intentions today is to bring the unconscious, because most of the time this is happening in our unconscious, we're not even aware of it, bring it forward today into the conscious so that you can learn a thing or two about it and deconstruct it. So the first thing is that trust is two-way. It's a two-way exchange. So can I let go and trust you to play your role and deliver and can you trust me to deliver what you expect of me? Back to the hunter-gatherer is an easier, easy way to think of it. Can we trust each other to play our role? One thing I would say that I've noticed that I'll offer up um, to you to ponder for yourself is in an executive coaching context, I would say I see this all the time, which is leaders tend to overfocus on whether they can trust the other. Is he trustworthy or she trustworthy? Are they trustworthy? And they tend to underfocus on their part, what they're doing to proactively and intentionally build trust with the other. So what am I doing to deserve their trust? What actions am I taking to demonstrate that they should trust me? So I want you to pause right now and just think about, is there a relationship that you have right now in which, and it could be at home as well, um, in which you have an opportunity to build greater two-way trust, to let that person know, to demonstrate to them that they can trust you. So ponder that and we'll come back to that. That's a bit of a teaser. So the next thing is that trust is earned and built over time. So one of the biggest thought pattern misses that I see is people thinking that trust should be assumed or granted. This happens all the time back to just trust each other, how I started today, is trust should not be assumed, should not be granted, because it doesn't work that way in the real world. Trust is a logical thing. It's earned through a series of interactions, and uh, you're in the driver's seat about what you're doing to build it. So it can also, as it says here, generally be repaired when broken. So we're all human, none of us is perfect. We're all fallible in a corporate context or any organizational context, we're still all growing and building muscles and learning new things. So generally we as humans are, are willing to give each other a lot of slack when it comes to um, building trust. So I'll, I'll give an example from my own career. When I was new to the C-suite, I was brought into the company. So I was new to the company, new to the C-suite. Um, major growth spurt for me in my career. And I was brought in at a time when our company was really in a key pivot point in our life stage, and we were really needing to scale and be more sustainable. And my boss had said to me, you know, you need to reset your leadership. I'm not sure you have the right talent on board, et cetera. You need to come in and, and figure that out. And six months later, I had my first evaluation and I got totally dinged for that. And she did not trust me to make the tough talent calls. And I objectively had been so focused on building connection in the team, building rapport, that I wasn't as courageous as I needed to be about making the tough talent calls. So 
she, you know, didn't trust me on that. And she told me so. Well, then I had to work on that in my own development. And, you know, six months later, when I had my next check in, I'd made a lot of progress and she built trust with me and got to know that she, that I was someone who was willing to do it. It was just a growing edge for me. So we're all, you all see this all the time. You're in, you know, you have development plans, you're giving them to your teams. You, you we do give each other a chance to grow and build trust. So. The next one is that trust is data-based. It's like I said, trust is a logical thing. And we learn whether we can trust someone over time through a series of evidence, through a series of proof points, and our past behavior is the greatest source of data when it comes to building trust. So we've all heard actions speak louder than words, and that is absolutely true when it comes to building trust. Another aspect of trust is that it's situational and dynamic. And this is one where, um, again, this is one where there's common, a common misstep in thinking about trust. And that is that often we hear the implication that trust is binary. Either I trust someone or I don't trust someone. But it doesn't really work like that. So trust is situational, meaning you can have, like I'll use the example of an em employee. You may trust one of your employees or team members to have complete discretion when it comes to a sticky HR topic. And you'll know that they will not breach confidentiality, but you can take that same team member and you may not trust them to deliver their Q3 budget numbers on a timely basis or with sufficient rigor needed. And so it's not a blanket thing. You know, I can think of my spouse, for example, and there are places that I trust her fully in terms of her honesty and her integrity and giving it to me straight. And then there are other places that I guess I won't name on, on something being videoed where I don't trust her quite as well. So this is um, a big unlock though, Susan, yeah. because it's like, I am a very trusting person. I give, I just assume trust. I give, you know, you have to kind of earn the right for me not to trust you. But when you guys, when I started learning your trust system, this, this is the thing that stuck with me. And you and Patty always say, there's no such thing as blanket trust. Yep. And it is, it's so, like uh, all the people, I love you dearly and you love me. And yet there are places we don't trust each other. Nobody should ever trust me with my own calendar. That is a disaster. Do not trust me to send out this link. Like, so it's not an, it's not an ethical issue. It's a situational issue based on all of these things, your competencies and what you're good at doing and, you know, what commitments you're making. And just that alone is, I feel like, a really important part of the whole trust discussion. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think for, for those participating today, so think of it, make it real for yourself and think about somebody on your team or a colleague of yours and just take a moment. We'll pause for a minute and think about where is a place where I completely trust them an area, and then where is a place that I, I don't? And so just debunk the fact here to get out of, the, uh, out of a, any kind of default that might be in your head about blanket trust, which is what Christine's point is, and to realize that it's more complex than that. Yeah, we're all untrustworthy for certain things <laughs> and we're all very trustworthy for others. Well, that's that's actually a really good a good way to say it. I wasn't going to say it that way, but I agree with you, Christine. We're all untrustworthy for certain things. So, OK, the next thing and Christine just alluded to this. So it's a perfect segue. Thank you for segueing for me, Christine, is that trust is not a moral judgment. So this is in some way a meta synthesis of the points above, but I hope I've started to you know, convey the point that trust is logical, it's data built, data based, it's earned and built over time, it's proven to each other, it can be repaired, it can be broken, and it's situational. And what it's not is a moral judgment. So we too often hear, I too often hear, I'm sure you've heard it as well, that this implication that someone who's trusting is good and someone who's not as trusting is not good or somehow less than. And I want to take it out of the out of the conversation here that, you know, trust is a moral equation or a moral evaluation. It's not. And now I'm not talking here about people who there are those really toxic people who never trust anyone. 
and who don't give anyone the slack. And that's not who I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the average person in an organization that has good intentions um, and uh, take it out of, out of the equation um, for them. So, okay. I'm gonna to go to the second part and we are gonna have time for Q and A today, by the way. So if you have any questions, jot them down and I'm happy with any time we have left to be able to field any questions. And you can also put anything you wanna say or ask in the chat and I'll monitor it for Susan and add them in if it's appropriate for the discussion. Yeah, you're totally welcome to do that. And we're gonna use chat in just a second for a little uh, um, check-in with you here. So, I've talked about, and I know I, I said I'm going to repeat, but repeating for intention of sinking it in that, you know, the ability to trust is based on the dependency of having clear roles, goals, and expectations. So I'll say for a minute here for probably many or most of you on this Zoom have heard of, have used different teaming models. So whether it's Tuckman's forming, norming, storming, performing, that seems to be one that almost everyone's heard of, or Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team no matter what teaming model it is, they all have as a basis to build trust, a key dependency of having clear roles, goals, and expectations. So that is, you'll find that in any teaming model, it's that fundamental. You can't build trust until you know what to expect of each other, until you know whether who's finding the plants that are safe to eat and who's keeping the perimeter safe from outside threats. So, but now I wanna invite you to, dig in with me on what are the four research-based factors that help to build trust. So I invite you to think about a high trust relationship you have or a high trust team you've been a part of and think about and pop into the chat box what um, attributes or characteristics those relationships or those teams had. Just name one or two and let's see what's in the collective field here. Are you seeing them, Susan, or you want me to read yep, them? I'm seeing them. Yep. And I'm just giving everyone a chance and then I'll kind of pop through some of them. So you can see everything from the making and meeting commitments, integrity, having each other's back, being honest, having experience, being willing to have open and frank discussions, being dependable, vulnerability, honesty, willingness to collaborate, transparency, doing what you say and saying what you'll do, being reliable, consistent, authenticity, support. So all of you have the experience, the felt or lived experience to know what it's like to be in a relationship where there's high trust. And, and so I wanna you know, just say that each of you knows and has had this experience. What I'm going to do is put, bring to life in a more analytical way four factors that do build trust. So the first one is affinity. And this is about kinship. Do you feel a kinship with this person? Um, and it's easiest to develop affinity for those of us who actually behave in ways that are familiar to me. So one of the ways that you can develop affinity with another is through mirroring behavior. So I don't know, I know on Netflix, Suits has been trending. I don't know how many of you have started to watch it on Netflix, but it's been one of the top three consistently. But um, in the, in the uh, TV series, the young attorney, Mike, comes into the law firm with the senior partner, Harvey, and he is trying to establish his credibility with Har Harvey, and he does a lot of mirroring behaviors. For those of you who've seen it, he shows his swagger, he shows he's bold, he upgrades his suits and starts to wear nicer suits to, to convey that he knows that they're in the big leagues, et cetera. And this is true in, in any organization. So one lever point is mirroring behaviors. But other ways you can build affinity are by sharing things in common with each other, common values, common experiences, and even in organizations, common obstacles. 
um, you know, as, when you're working on a really challenging project together or in a really challenging point in a business, you're facing common obstacles. And as you work on those together, it's a way that you can really build that affinity, you know, the sort of battle worn experiences we have. Su Susan, can you just briefly touch on the two edged sword that is affinity in this day and age? Because, you know, there's great things about it. And then there's some unconscious bias that comes in. as Yeah. Well. So this is a bit of a charged uh, term or can be, I should say it can be a bit of a charged term in a DEIB diversity, inclusion, belonging kind of a framework, because you can argue that in the old days, affinity was abused um, consciously or and or unconsciously to be like people like me. And we know that diversity and inclusion and um, having diverse teams is, you know, more and more being proven to be a key competitive edge in organizations, if not something that we all want to strive for, for other reasons. So, you know, affinity can be seen as having a negative lens in a DEIB um, context. What I want to put forth here is that it, it could, if you look at it that way, but when you, if you think of affinity as common goals, common um, motivations, common values, common experiences, common obstacles, it can help get it out of that context. Christine, is that what you were thinking? Yeah, it's a, it's a good call out because it can be seen in a, in a negative way, yeah. You want, you want it and need it, but it can't be based on, you know, the way we look or the where we grew up or that we both played sports together, whatever the sort of more traditional ones might have been in the yeah, old, old school, school days, old school. Yeah, old and so school. we have to find ways to build affinity. It's critical. It's the, it, one of the things I learned from you guys is where there is affinity and the way I understand it from your teaching is I know that you get me and I know that I get you, we get each other. Yeah. Like it's an oversimple, but if, if I know if there's affinity, if I know you really grok me, then even if all the other stuff is going to shit on the trust side, if we've got this established, we're good. We got a chance to repair. It's going to be easier to get through any of, of the breakages that are happening elsewhere. If yep. we don't have this, if, if you don't, if I think you don't really grok me, then it's going to be really hard if anything else isn't in place because the trust isn't going to be there. Well, that can be true. And it's also a bit of a setup. So that's, a, Christine, you, you and I didn't rehearse this at all, but you're giving me perfect segues today. So that's a really good segue to this point. So Christine's point is valid. So I'm not going against what she said, but there's an and to this, which is what if you're new to a team, you need to build trust quickly. Affinity is something that's built over time. So one of the challenges of it is, you know, it takes time to build affinity. And when you have it, it's gold. That's true. But often in organizations, we don't have the time or haven't had the time to build affinity. So what can you do to build trust quickly in a, a situation where affinity is not there? And I coach a ton in leadership transition scenarios. So, you know, new to a company, onboarding newly promoted into a role, you know, two teams combined and now, you know, the leader is leading one team or even new boss and onboarding to a new boss. Any of those situations, you're not going to have affinity out of the gate. So you can work on building affinity, but here are two levers that you can, that are actionable tomorrow for anyone. And those are competence and reliability. So competence is, can they do it? Are they credible? Are they an expert? Do they have the talent and skills to do it? And reliability is, will they? Are they consistent? Are they timely? Do they follow through? When I'm working with leaders, I have a couple right now in my, in my um, group that in my portfolio of clients who are new to a company. And, you know, we're talking a lot about what are they doing to demonstrate at their new company where no one knows them, they have no equity built up, that they deserve to be trusted. And these two levers, and you can think of them as levers in some ways, are ones where people can actionably focus on building that two-way trust out of the gate. 
So these are two, affinity takes longer, it's more enduring in some ways, competence and reliability are actionable tomorrow for any of us. Um, so we, the other thing about competence and reliability is we all know that they're not both always to be assumed. So someone can be a very competent engineer, for example, great at troubleshooting, great at creative problem solving, um, but, but he may not be able to be depended on to follow through on his commitments. Or on the inverse, somebody may be, you know, if he says he's getting it to you by nine o'clock in the morning, it'll be in your inbox. But you as the leader might have to triple check his Q3 budget numbers to use that example. So, you know, it's there that you can have one without the other and it can have trust be wobbly. Okay. The fourth one is integrity. A lot of you brought this up in the chat and I'm gonna um, spend a little bit more time on this one because it has some nuance. So integrity is why will they do it? And it's all about what's their motive or agenda. Um, in, in the language we usually hear around integrity is language like what's their true motive? Are they out for themselves or do they really care about the team or the company? Will they have my back? Or will they talk about my back? Or will they give me the credit or my team the credit that we deserve? Or will they take the credit for themselves? Will they say one thing to me and another behind my back? Will they tell me the truth to my face? Those are all integrity um, dimensions, I guess I'd say, and aspects that are very real and alive in organizations um, today. One of the things from an integrity standpoint that erodes integrity the fastest is private conversations. And I'm highlighting this today because this is one of those, if you can take away one thing from today that will help you foster greater trust on a team, it's to eliminate private conversations on the team. It's one of the things that um, erodes trust the most dramatically and quickly. And that is talking behind another's back or as a boss, uh, enabling in any way or a member of a leadership team, enabling by not saying something, others to ha have private conversations or attempt to have private conversations. So this is one of those real toxins on a team. And when Patty and I work with teams, we almost always, I never say always because there's probably always an exception, but we almost always recommend that the team adopts a guiding principle of no side conversations or no or private conversations if one of their goals is to um, increase their high performing behaviors and build trust together. Private conversations are the tar pit. Yeah. Right, right from the board all the way down to the individual contributors. That's the tar pit. It's, it's so true. Great insight on the board as well. I have, I have two clients right now dealing with this um, with their boards as well. So that's absolutely yeah. true. That is. And, you know, you can have every good. This used to be a big bugaboo of mine. And I've learned to be much more careful that even when you have every good intention, you're just trying to build rapport with each person, just different conversations that are private. If you share anything that could be construed as negative against anybody else, it's going to erode your own trust. Um, so I think for leaders, this is a really, really hard one and really important one. Um, Michelle asked a question, Susan, um, yeah. you might answer it now or later, but reflecting back on your experience at the beginning, building trust, but not exiting underperformers, what would you have done differently? And how can you build trust by making those kinds of hard decisions? Sure. I will be happy to take that one now. I'm just looking at my, my, uh, a phone and we're on time. So I'll take that one now. This is a huge, I, I cannot tell you all how often this comes up in my coaching, this dynamic. It's a tough one. I don't think anyone has an answer with a capital A of how to do this right. But what I will say, I can talk from my own experience too. I, I got stung by my lack of courage of doing it and an over pivoting on trying to create quote unquote safety so this is, you know, psychological safety is a big buzzword in organizations today. So how do you create both a high performing culture and one where you have psychological safety? How do you set the right leadership team and exit out your underperformers 
while still, while not having everybody be in fear. I mean, this is, you know, I do not pretend to be the be all and end all answer of that question. It's a really hard one. But what I do know is that, you know, and I've said this many times to, to many clients of mine, if you have a performance issue underneath you that you're not dealing with, it is your performance issue. So their performance issue becomes yours. And there is a point in leadership where you can start to feel that arc go in the wrong direction for you, which is you've given them enough of a chance. You put them on a pip, you've coached them, you've coached up, you've given them, you know, maybe you've given them a coach, maybe you've sent them to training, but when it continues to go on for too long, which is what is too long, that's a, that's a situationally dependent question, then you, you know that it's your performance issue at some point. And that's the service my boss did to me calling me on it at six months is she let me know this is going to be your performance issue if you don't fix this. And she was right. And it is a tough one, finding the balance of giving people a chance versus making the tough call. So I don't think I've answered your question with an answer, but it's a well, tough I'll, And I'll, let me build on it because again, this is pure change cast teaching but, and how you do it is what matters most, how you exit them that, and that people see it. Because if you, if you give people a chance and you still have to exit, and by the way, this applies for layoffs too, completely different situations. But as you do it, you preserve their human dignity with them and with others on the team, you will build trust. But if you leave people who are unperformers on the team, and even when people see you trying and so forth, that becomes your trust issue because they can't trust you to do what's right for the team. Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot going on in the chat. So let's, I'm going to make a proposal. Let's, I I want to go ahead, Christine. Yeah, no, keep going. I'll oh, I was going to say, I'm going to keep going. And then let's take the anytime we have at the end, I don't have too much else to cover here. So let me wrap up and then we'll take the time we have to go over um, some of your other questions about, I see lots about side conversations and Slack and chat. And those are big, <laughs> totally agree. Those are big challenges in today's operating context. Okay, so if private conversations is one of the big um really toxins when it comes to integrity. Um, The other one is any kind of breach in integrity, um, which is, it's, I guess it's not a toxin. It's the thing to know, which is if you have a breach on the integrity um, factor, it's the toughest to rebuild. So you can rebuild trust more easily by improving on your competence, improving on your reliability, building that affinity for example, across these four. But if you have a breach in integrity, it's the toughest to rebuild. And this goes back to, for some of you may have heard of John Gottman, who's an expert in marriage research. He did a ton of research over many years about couples and what helps relationships succeed and fail um, in that arena. And uh, infidelity in the case of marriage was the single biggest thing that many couples could not come back from. Um, And what's interesting is the science of teams and organizations has duplicated in some ways, different contexts, that same research. When there are integrity breaches in a team, it's very tough for teams to rebuild that. And so I saw one of the questions that one of you asked in chat was about what do you do if like you enter into a new team and the culture on that team is to have side conversations, for example. And so that's that you can, as a leader, educate your team. You can educate them about this same issue and to say on the teams I work on, my learning, my standard for a team is that we trust, we build trust together and we create integrity in our teams. And you can let them know that you will not, you can't control what other people do, but you can let them know that you won't tolerate it or abide by it as a leader and and help them understand why and take a stand for it. But yeah, it can be tough to, you know, one person changing a culture, it takes time. So Okay, so finally, I'm just going to give you a couple minutes. We don't have time to workshop this today, but I want to invite you to come away from this segment with something actionable for you. 
So take a moment, maybe the, the relationship that I asked you to think about earlier in this session and think about an inventory of a relationship you have or a team you're on or team you lead and think about what can I do to build greater trust. And I don't expect you to have time to answer all the questions in the yellow box here, but pick a couple that resonate with you for your situation. Just follow the flow here. You start by asking yourself if roles, goals, and expectations are clear. And if they're not, what can I do to clarify them? And then ask yourself about this relationship. Where is trust already strong? So remember, it's situational and two-way nature. Identify a trust-building opportunity in the relationship. Ask yourself, is there something I can do to demonstrate and build greater trust with them? And is there a specific request I have of the other person or team so that they can build greater trust with me? So I'm just gonna give you a minute or so here um, to, for of some quiet reflection time to jot some notes. And, and I invite you to come away with something actionable today for you. And I'm not asking you to put it in the chat, private notes, <laughs> not to reveal, not to divulge your private things. <laughs> Susan, if we have a few minutes um, when we get done with this part, maybe you could talk a little bit about how to go about rebuilding trust when it breaks, um, because there is sort of a, you know, a formula you can follow there too that relates right back to this, um, whether it's with teams or individuals. Um, and then also in brand new relationships, how you can use this model to accelerate trust. Sure. Uh, and we Patty happy had to talk about that. Yeah. And Patty said something really interesting, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago about how, you know, you can in new relationships where trust is going to be so essential, you can start right up front saying, you know, what hap what are we going to do if trust breaks? Let's figure out now you know, she said like in software or in marketing, you always assume in processes that something's going to go wrong. You just assume that. So you create up front the process to fix things when they go wrong. You know what it's going to be. But we never do that in relationships, even when the trust is so critical. And yeah. so I thought it was a really interesting insight and it stuck with me. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I will. OK, I will. And you're welcome to take. I think the Zappa team is going to post this on your YouTube channel, right? This, yep. so yep. you'll we'll edit it. You can take a screen grab of this if it's relevant and I'll um, move on with this. And I'll come back to the questions Christine just asked. Um, I just have one more slide here and then we can talk about this. Um, I it wouldn't be complete to talk about the topic of trust without talking about the topic of trusting yourself. And I haven't hit on that yet. And so I'm ending on this point that your most important trusting relationship is the one you have with yourself. And we underestimate sometimes the importance of building trust with, with ourselves. And what's interesting is, I'm going to flip back to the chart before, these same factors, affinity, not as much affinity, because hopefully you can relate to yourself, but you can certainly build respect for yourself, but competence, reliability, and integrity, these same factors are things you can use to build trust with yourself. So um, I invite you to think about the fact that the most important trusting relationship is the one you have with yourself and that the same framework applies to yourself. So I am going to go off slides here, give you a break from that and um, invite you into, I'm gonna, I'll comment on Christine's two questions, first of all, and I can pop the slides back up if it's helpful. But in terms of accelerating trust proactively, back to two way. Um, so if you think about it, I have, I have a client right now who she joined a new company in a few months ago. 
And we talked a lot about how she can start to build, use the reliability and, and um, competence factors right off the bat with her peers and her boss to build trust, that those are highly actionable. And that can look like things, it can just be tweaks in your language. So it can look like things like, hey, John, I know that um, it's important to you that, uh, that you get this report or update or whatever the thing is from me on a timely basis. Does it work for you if I commit to Fridays by 10 a.m.? And then doing it. So what that's saying to John there is she's paying attention. She's letting me know she's willing to be reliable and consistent. It's a proactive thing. And so it's it's a dial turn. It's not that it's like anything too difficult, but it's it's taking the, your inside language and putting it out loud with your partners. Hey, I know it's important that my team, let's say the team has been having an issue. Let's Let's use budget as an example where their budget hasn't been airtight, they haven't been reliable on their budget, you're talking to the CFO and you're in the C-suite. Let's say you're a CMO in the C-suite. You say, hey, I know we haven't been reliable or competent on getting you our budget in the right manner, on the right time, with the right level of rigor. I want you to know that I'm gonna fix it and here's what I'm gonna do. And then when you do it, say, how's that working for you? So there are things, it's taking the inside, outside, overtly languaging it, following up with your partners, letting them know you're in a two-way, you don't have to say I'm building trust with you, that's not what I'm saying, but you're in a two-way exchange with them where you're letting them know you can depend on me. I'm paying attention, I'm on it, you can depend on me. And people underestimate the power of that simple dial turn of making that more explicit with their partners and teams. So that's one thing you can absolutely um, do. Christine's point about the um, when you're working with team formation and you're setting up team agreements, what are we going to do when the chips fall down, when we fall down, when we break trust, when we don't deliver? How I am a firm believer in that as well, that you design an agreement into when you miss the mark, because you will, because we're human, we're fallible. So when you miss then, it, you, you can hold each other accountable on your team. Hey, we said when we missed the mark that we would talk about it in our leadership team meeting with no judgment, but that we would learn about it so we didn't do it again. We said that we would raise our hands about our accountability around the issue. Whatever your agreement is, it can look all sorts of different ways. So um, I'll pause there. Christine, did I address your question? Yes, Julie? thank you very much. And I, I use this framework now very proactively. If I have a really critical relationship that I'm starting, I will start out by telling them explicitly where not to trust me. And it's part of, and, and I'm honest about it. It's like, one, don't trust me with things like calendar or, you know, make an airline reservations or shit like that. I will screw it up. And I apologize in advance because I don't have an assistant anymore and I'm going to screw something up. But I can also say, you know, don't tr like, I'm not good at being vulnerable in the moment. I'm not good at laughing at myself or when tension gets high, like using humor to break it. If you are, I need your help there. So like you can find places right away to allow your, your weaknesses to match up with somebody else's strengths. You immediately have an opportunity to build trust together in the places you're not good. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And I'll, I'll, I, I'll hop on to Ben's question here in the chat, which is a great one. Um, so I'm not saying, and I want to make sure you don't come away from the situation of saying, I'm not saying you don't talk about, let's just say John and Mary Sue on the team and Juan, John, Juan and Mary Sue, let's say you're there on your team. I'm not saying you never say, Hey, I heard from John the other day that blank and blank and blank. I'm not saying you don't use each other's names or anything that you get weird about it. I'll say it that way. You can, what you can do when you're onboarding though, specifically to starting a new role, trying to fix issues. I mean, again, I work on a lot of leader, leader onboarding. My way I think about it and, and advise people is to be consistent. So you say to everyone on your team, I'm gonna be having these conversations with everyone and I'm going to be asking everyone, what do you think we need to affix? 
Where do you think we're doing well? I'm gonna be asking the same group of questions because I'm trying to get onboarded quickly. I'm trying to figure out where to place my attention, where you guys need me. Just, and that's a high integrity way to do that. You let everyone know you're doing it and you do it consistently. And then people know that it's not, they know what's going on. And that helps people feel, maybe they don't feel comfortable, but at least it's transparent. Other comments, questions? We've got some amazing experts um, on this call who have written books about this stuff. So if we've missed the mark here or if we've left something out or you want to add your own perspective, please do so. And I'm thinking Larry and Bev for starters, but anybody else who wants to jump in. I... Uh... Do you want us to speak? If you'd like, if you have something to say, this is Bev Kay. She's, you guys have probably written, read some of her books um, around culture and how, you know, love them and lose them and <laughs> uh, how to get people to be engaged in your company. You know, it's just, and Susan, you know this, that how to get people to be engaged is those four areas you mentioned. I love your C words. For affinity, you have connection. For competence, you have credible. For reliability, you have consistent. What was the C word for integrity? Hmm. I didn't, the, I don't, I don't, let me look. Let me look at the, my notes. Uh, those C words, I don't know, they're I can grab them easier. Yeah, you could do C words. I mean, I didn't, we didn't design it to have C I words. Know. There, there I, isn't I, a C word, but- how about, how about consistency? Consistency, well, consistency yeah. is one of them, but the yeah. one I think you're asking is integrity for yeah. integrity. Yeah. There is no C word for integrity. So. I will figure it out. <laughs> okay. I love There's a new book coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, this is Larry. I did have a kind of outside the box thought. I think in going through life, people can have either a strong tendency to be non-trusting, in which case they may be skeptical, be more judgmental, more critical, or, or a tendency to, in general, believe that everybody's got a good self, that everybody has the best self. Yeah. They're all just doing the best they can. This whole notion of, in working with teams, the, the power of assuming positive intention in teammates because otherwise you go to judgment right away. But to them, it made sense. I think changes the quality of our life. So I tend to, perhaps a bit contrary, I tend to, people have to do something for me not to trust them or not to believe there's goodness in them. And uh, and that's just a stance in life. Uh, but I, but all the points you made make sense. I think it, it is situational. It can be rebuilt. Uh, yeah, uh, we there are things I can't be trusted on. Uh, my wife will tell you in terms of picking up things or whatever. <laughs> but no side uh, conversations, tar pits. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so that's a a thought about trust. I totally agree with you, Larry. And I think in in a team, a really healthy if you're doing team formation work and standing up a new team or resetting a team for high performing behaviors, I think assuming positive intent is a great guiding principle for teams to have. So I know, I, hard one to, and I mean, how many teams say that? And, and yet, you know, like you say, people are wired a certain way or trust has been broken so many times. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's hard. It's a great idea. And it's, you know, we all know in real world team environments, it can be very challenging to execute. Susan, this was awesome. I've, you know, I've heard this how many times over how many years and I learn stuff every time. I love the nuances. This is so critical for all of us to be great leaders and great partners in life with people. Um, thank you all for joining in. And I have a request for all of you. Um, we'll send out an email with some summaries of this afterwards in case you want to share and telling you about our next session. Who's our next session, Betty? Is it Adam said? Um, Adam is amazing. His father was one of the founders of Whole Foods. He, by the time he was like 13, he was a major drug addict. He's almost died multiple times. I think he weighed 250 or 300 pounds. 
and 300 pounds. And now he is, I don't know, 30, give or take. He is an amazing young man, um, totally has his life together, just got married, super fit, writing books about how to get from here to there. And a lot of what he focuses on is learning from the blue zones and how you take control of your own life and set yourself up for success or help other people who are struggling set themselves up for success. It's not about willpower. It's about how you design your environment. It's a fascinating talk. It'll be for January where we're all coming into the new year with these resolutions. How do you set yourself up for success or your team on these resolutions? My request for you is please share the invitation to this session with other people, your teams, your entire team, just somebody you know. We wanna spread this enrichment and we wanna build the community. So help us do that. And if you specifically have um, ideas for us on people that go in the HR community um, and or the CRO leader community or any of our other communities, we again, we want to build that. And we'll be giving those people some board training for next year. Happy holidays, everybody. And thank you very much for starting your Friday with us. It, it's very meaningful. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Amazing job, as always. You're a rock star. Thank you. Take care.